What's up, everybody? I'm Finn McKenty. This is the Punk Rock NBA, and today we are here to talk about Mudvayne, a band that has had a very unusual career. When they came out, they were written off by the usual critics and music snobs as Slipknot copycats, as that new metal band that glued bugles to their faces, and of course, for... And it's only recently, 20 years after their debut album came out, the people are really starting to look at Mudvayne differently. Because in hindsight, what they did is combine two things that on paper couldn't be combined. On the one hand, they were partly new metal, which was seen as the most low class, trashy genre of music on the planet. But yet on the other hand, they somehow combined that with the sophisticated highbrow genre of progressive metal. That combination was like nothing else that we had heard before. And now decades later, they've grown to become one of the most beloved bands of that era. So how did they do it? And what is their lasting impact and legacy? Those are the questions that I will answer in this video. But first, if you haven't, please check me out on Twitch. I'm streaming twice a week from 4 to 7 p.m. Pacific on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And there's a link to that in the description of this video. And also, I want to thank SeatGeek for sponsoring this video. I know you guys love going to shows and I have great news for you today. You can get $20 off tickets at SeatGeek with promo code PUNKROCKMBA. And if you don't know what SeatGeek is, they're a ticketing app that makes buying tickets super simple. I've got the app on my phone and it is by far and away the easiest way to buy tickets. They have sports, festivals, and of course music from all over the world, all in one place. So you are just one click away from headbanging at the next Slipknot show or thirsting over Ollie Sykes in the front row or check out any of the tours that are going on right now. For example, Day to Remember, My Chemical Romance, and Panic at the Disco are all out on the road. And SeatGeek wants to make sure that you're getting a good deal, so look for the green dots. Green means good deal, red means bad deal. They make it that easy. And I've got the hookup. Just use code PUNKROCKMBA for $20 off tickets at SeatGeek. That's $20 off your first purchase with promo code PUNKROCKMBA. Just click the link in the description of this video to download the app. Mudvayne started in 1996 in the humble city of Peoria, Illinois, but the band's origins are actually a few years earlier than that in a local band called Brainsaw, which was actually everybody in the original lineup of Mudvayne, with the exception of Mudvayne's future guitarist, Greg. When Brainsaw broke up, the original Mudvayne bassist, Sean Barclay, put the new band together, and after a year or so, they put out a self-released EP called Kill I Oughta. And it was a little bit rough, really, it was just like a combination of demo tracks that they had recorded as well as some live stuff. But still, it was enough to get the attention of Epic Records, Home of Corn, and many other bands who signed Mudvayne in 1999. Ironically, the original bassist that put Mudvayne together left the band and in his place, they recruited Ryan Martini, who at the time was playing bass in an instrumental progressive band called Broken Altar. And with the addition of Ryan, that is when Mudvayne really became Mudvayne. Here's what Mudvayne's guitarist, Greg, Tribbett had to say. Our whole vision began to change after Ryan joined. We had been talking for a while about wanting to be more than just four guys going on stage in blue jeans and t-shirts and playing our songs. We wanted to bring a level of theatricality to our performance. So that's when we started experimenting with the makeup. And with that new vision and lineup in place, they went into the studio with producer Garth Richardson, who was known for working with some of the most iconic 90s bands like Rage Against the Machine, Melvins, and Testament. And they recorded their debut album, LD50, which came out in August of 2000. But if you think that is when the band's career took off, you would actually be wrong. They put their time in on the road as one of the opening bands on the Tattoo of the Earth Festival in 2000, which was headlined by Slipknot, Slayer, Sepultura, and Cold Chamber. And they looked at it as really just winning the fans over one show at a time. The industry saw the organic support that they were getting on tour with that kind of like blue collar, hard nosed approach. And so when they put out the video for Dig in 2001, MTV put that into rotation and that is when the band really exploded and probably like a lot of you that video was the first time that i heard the band and aside from corn i didn't really like a lot of new metal at the time but you just couldn't ignore that video when it came on for one they didn't look like anybody else plenty of new metal bands had some edgy sort of look but mudvayne really took it to another level with the body paint the crazy dyed hair and the goatee and all that the wild performances where it looked like they were on meth and just out of their minds 
Prince, and the guitarist was even covered in spikes that looked like they were coming out of his skin. Although it turns out those were just the bugles, snacks, painted black, and glued to his face. It's gonna be the raddest thing we'll you've ever seen. Bugles on his face, glue them. Can you paint them? We can make them. We can make them longer. They also had very late '90s new metal nicknames like Cud, Spad, and Gerg. They were a band, but it really almost felt more like they were pro wrestlers or movie characters in some ways. I was never personally into pro wrestling or anything, so I thought that aspect of the band was a little bit corny. But even so, there's absolutely no denying that it did set them apart from every other band that just dressed like normal dudes off the street with some boring video of them playing in a grungy warehouse or whatever. Going back to what Greg said about wanting to bring some theatricality to their music, it definitely worked. And as much as I kind of rolled my eyes at the way they looked, their music could not be denied. At the time, I was really into a lot of progressive metal like Candiria, Cynic, and Dillinger Escape Plan. And as soon as I heard Dig, I was like, okay, hold on, this is legit. These guys could obviously play, especially the bassist Ryan Martini and the drummer Matthew McDonough. One thing that I think is also oftentimes overlooked is that this album also had several tracks of like ambient, experimental, electronic kind of stuff on it. And so if there was such a thing as progressive new metal, this was it. Kind of like the entry level version of Meshuggah. And that combination of, I guess what you could call lowbrow visuals with relatively highbrow music was very interesting. And it sounds like that was actually very very deliberate on the band's part. Like, I think we were inspired by visual art. I think we were inspired by movies. You know, there's content, there's a visual, there's a score. So we, we wanted to kind of bring that to the table. Like when we started, like the score is the music, obviously the, the content is the, is the lyrics and the, and the visual was, you know, us being idiots. Years later, Chad Gray said that in his words, LD 50 was kind of a pretentious whack off session, but I don't really see it that way. I do see what he's getting at in the sense that oftentimes progressive music or experimental music can sort of lose sight of the song and just become like musical masturbation. But I don't think they did that. With that being said, although the album didn't become the sort of massive commercial smash hit that you saw from like Korn or Limp Bizkit, it did go gold. They won a VMA for Dig and it was clear that they were an exciting new addition to the metal scene. And so with all of that under their belt, they took a bit of a victory lap by opening for the Merry Mayhem tour with Ozzy Osbourne and Rob Zombie, a clear sign that they had arrived. And in 2002, they released their second album, The End of All Things to Come, which kind of picks up where LD50 left off. Musically, it's pretty similar, just with clearer production and I guess you could say more diverse songwriting. For example, on the one hand, it has these really like ambitious, technical, progressive songs like Trapped in the Wake of a Dream, which for the music nerds goes between some very odd time signatures like 11, 8 and 17, 8. And if you're not a music nerd, that just basically means it's a really fucking weird song. And if you were already listening to bands like Meshuggah and Candiria, then maybe this wasn't new to you. But for the millions of kids out there who were listening to Limp Bizkit and Cold Chamber the year before they heard this album, this sound was mind blowing. But the album wasn't just this progressive nerd fest. It also had much more accessible songs like their lead single, Not Falling, which was their biggest commercial success to date. I But still, in spite of all that, the band was kind of written off by a lot of critics as just another corny new metal band. For example, Spin gave it a 30 and their review was just one word. No. And in another huge opportunity that put them in front of massive, massive audiences that really leveled up their career. In 2003, they also joined the Summer Sanitarium Tour with Metallica, Limp Bizkit, Linkin Park, and Deftones. Get ready to be committed to the sanitarium. Metallica's Summer Sanitarium Tour 2003. Things were going great for the band. They just kept leveling up with every album and every tour, but they weren't content to just keep doing more of the same. In 2005, they released their third album, Lost and Found, which changed a lot of things up. 
For one, they got rid of the body paint, the crazy nicknames, and a lot of that theatrical stuff, because as much as that helped them break through in the beginning, it was also working against them in the sense that it oftentimes kind of overshadowed the music. The solids, you know, were, was, was the music, and the content of the music. And we felt like that, that visual is overpowering the score and the content. So we're like, let's do it, you know, let's see if we can still win here. And we took it off and people still, still loved it. And second, they took the music in a much more accessible direction that was closer to maybe more kind of palatable mainstream rock like Breaking Benjamin than it was to just sort of the experimental chaos of LD50, especially the lead single, Happy. And you can still hear that super tight technical rhythm section that stood out so much on LD50, but it's far more subdued. And the songs on this album are certainly good, but for anybody that got into them after hearing Dig, a lot of people felt like it just wasn't the same. With that being said, it was obviously working for them because this album was by far their commercial peak. All those years of touring with Ozzy, Metallica, and Linkin Park paid off. And on the back of Happy, this album hit number two on Billboard. And they did all that without relying on the theatricality and the body paint and all that stuff, proving that they could succeed on the merits of their music alone. Still, to a lot of fans, it felt like the band had kind of lost their spark, and maybe things weren't entirely good behind the scenes. The first thing was in 2006, when Chad and Greg from Mudvayne got together with Tom Maxwell of Nothing face and Vinnie Paul of Pantera to start a supergroup called Hell Yeah, who released their first album in 2007. And anytime you see some sort of a side project start like that, especially one involving someone as high profile as Vinnie Paul, you start to wonder and worry a little bit. And so it looked like the band was maybe breaking up, but that wasn't the case, at least not yet. In 2008, they released their fourth album, New Game, which got mixed reviews. And while there was really nothing wrong with it, most fans and reviewers felt like there was just kind of something missing. It was still Mudvayne, but especially compared to LD50, it felt kind of flat and uninspired, more like a slightly edgier Chevelle or something than the crazy intensity and just like barely controlled chaos of their earlier stuff. With no As one review said, the new game signifies Mudvayne's transition from elite metal juggernaut to their inevitable fade into obscurity. And in 2009, barely a year later, the band released their self-titled album, which to be honest, really just kind of felt like they had run out of steam. I think Spin's review of this album actually put it really well. These guys once flailed like a future prog version of Slipknot, but now their doomy riff rama comes equipped with mellow bellow butt rock choruses. The cool progressive stuff from their first two albums is really barely there at all. You can hardly hear the bass. And honestly, it just feels kind of phoned in and uninspired. And I don't know what was happening behind the scenes, but maybe that is true because the band didn't tour around the album. The label didn't promote it. It seemed like really just nobody believed in this album and it didn't even hit the Billboard Top 50. And I'm not sure what was happening behind the scenes, but clearly something was off because the band went on hiatus in 2010, while Chad and Greg did Hell Yeah full time for the next several years. Hell Yeah may have originally been a side project, but it quickly grew into a full time band, releasing four more albums and it seemed like Mudvayne was just done forever, especially after Mudvayne's guitarist Greg Tribbett also quit Hell Yeah. Given how closely him and Chad worked together, it seemed like the end of an era. As Chad put it, when everything went sideways, it was like losing a great friend. I was filled with fear and I had mixed emotions. At first, I was like, God damn, I don't know if I'm ever going to be able to do this without him. But still, the fans relentlessly demanded a Mudvayne reunion, and in 2021, they got their wish. Mudvayne played a handful of festivals that that year. And this year, 2022, they did a full US tour for the first time in 12 years with Rob Zombie, Static X, and Power Man 5000. And honestly, it feels like they're bigger and more relevant than ever. And obviously, they were a big band in the 2000s. I mean, they did 
it hit number two on Billboard. But it feels like now they've got the influence and respect to go along with that. Like now they've ascended to almost the same level as those truly legendary bands like Slipknot and Deftones. And so the final question is, what is their lasting impact and legacy? Well, to me, it's two things. For one, they showed that new metal can be more than just single note bounce riffs with a DJ scratching. And second, they were a gateway to progressive metal for millions of kids. Obviously, there were many other bands who had done progressive metal before them, like Cynic and Atheist and Meshuggah and all those bands. But unless you were pretty plugged into the underground scene, you weren't going to hear any of that stuff. And even if you did happen to hear them somehow or another, it was not exactly the most accessible stuff for a 14 or 15 year old kid who was just getting into metal. But Mudvayne could be the band to bridge that gap. They were all over MTV. They were hitting the Billboard top 10. And so who knows how many kids heard Dig and it just made that light bulb go off in their brain. And that was the moment that they started going down the rabbit hole of technical progressive metal. I don't know the exact answer, but I can tell you this, the Mudvayne to Archspire pipeline is real. All right, my friends, that does it for this video. As always, let me know what you think in the comments. And I would like to thank everyone who supports me on Patreon, especially those of you who support at the true cult level or above. Patrons get all my podcasts early. I do giveaways. I do some other fun stuff. And there's a way to have me review your music or artwork. All you need to do is join at the $10 and up level. Then every month I do a call for submissions. If you want me to review something, just drop it in the comments of that post. Then I will review it live on Twitch and post the review on Patreon for everyone to see. So if that sounds cool to you, hit the link in the description of this video. And with that, I'm going to sign off for now, but I will see you next time.